Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming and all of you out there in uh, Zoom land. <laughs> we'll see you. Well, are we on Zoom? Yeah, okay. Um, well, today I'm going to talk uh, about William Herschel, and I titled this talk Backyard Astronomy in the 18th Century because in fact, all of Herschel's observing was done from the back garden of one or another of his houses. This is our man, William Herschel. This is a portrait, I think the best portrait of him done in uh, 1785 by Lemuel Abbott. Lemuel, what a name. The only other Lemuel I know of was Lemuel Gulliver. Gulliver Strauss. So I was pleased to see that it's a real name. Uh, and he was a very well known artist uh, who did lots of portraits of officials and naval officers, including a famous portrait of Horatio Nelson. And one thing about Herschel, of course, don't forget, he was a well known professional musician long before he became an amateur. <laughs> who turned professional uh, with the support of King George II. Was second or third? Second. Second, yeah. Um, and uh, one thing he did that might come to your notice is that in Bath, the most fashionable resort uh, of the time, everybody from London society would make a beeline for Bath during the during the summer, especially, but also during the year, to uh, to take the waters, and they needed entertainment. And so, uh, there's a handbill from Herschel's benefit concert of the Messiah, and you'll notice that he's got Miss Herschel there as one of the vocal parts. That's his sister Caroline, who's a very fine soprano, and uh, uh, others. And he also, I believe, not only sang in the in the presentation. Uh, but also uh, conducted and possibly played one or two musical instruments as well. I don't know what he was doing. Well, not all at the same time. Not all at the same time. That's very difficult. And uh, you notice the bottom it says tickets, five shillings each. This is a benefit from Mr. Herschel at 19 New King Street in Bath and at the, uh, the uh, rooms, the new rooms. Um, we'll come back to. Messiah and Herschel's music a little later. But what about some of his scientific achievements? Now, everybody has heard about his discovery of Uranus. He's very, very famous for that, and his name would never be forgotten. But he did lots of other things, in pioneering ways, uh, the construction of large telescopes, vectors, very unusual uh, back in the 18th century. Uh, he devised some instruments for solar observing. You know, the main problem is to reduce the intensity of the light uh, to such a level that it would be safe to look through the telescope. Uh, I'm not going to say any more about that, but there is a device called the Herschel wedge, which he invented, which removes uh, about 100,000 uh, parts. Well, it only lets through one part for about 100,000, which is what you need, what we would call the neutral density five. For safe viewing. Uh, he made systematic studies of planets, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You'll see some of his drawings of Saturn a little later. He uh, studied Mars very carefully and was able to improve the accuracy of the rotation period of Mars, as it was known then. Uh, he also, with his larger telescopes, found several satellites of Saturn and Uranus. He used micrometer to measure asteroid sizes, because the, as far as most people uh, were able to decide that uh, these were point-like objects in the solar system, he was able to see a visible disk on a couple of the very largest ones. I think it was Ceres and uh, Juno. Um, he also discovered double stars, but that was almost by accident because he was looking for something else. He was looking for a, a method to determine stellar paradox, which was the great uh, goal of astronomy 
all through the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries and onward. And Tycho, for example, didn't believe in, in uh, the Copernican system because he couldn't find parallax of the planets with his accurate observations, naked eye observations. Think about it. The, the nearest star is less than one arc second of parallax. So of course he couldn't have found it. Uh, he also discovered many nebulae and clusters, some of the ones that you saw pictures of here tonight. If they are NGC numbers, that's from Herschel's catalog initially. He made systematic analyses of star counts in different directions in the sky and discovered that the local star system was more or less a flattened uh, sort of thick pancake shape. He determined the solar motion with respect to other nearby stars. I'll say more about that later. And he discovered solar infrared heat. And he was able to prove that it was similar to life in its properties. <coughs> they didn't know about the wave nature of light then. They didn't know about the particle nature of light then. All they knew is that all he was able to find out was that energy in the part of the spectrum below the red was actually stronger than that in the visible. Um, well, we'll say a few words about uh, Herschel. I'll leave this slide up if you'd like to just uh, speak to. So, Friedrich Wilhelm Herschel, he was one of the 10 children of a bandmaster in the Hanoverian Guards, and he was born in Hanover in 1738. And all of them had to earn their own living. William's first musical job was a, as an oboist in the Hanover Band. Um, the Elector of Hanover and the King of England being the same person, George II, movement between the two countries was relatively easy. And in due course, William came to England and held various positions as an organist, as a music tutor and a performer. And he, uh, he was organist notably in Halifax in the north of England. He worked there for some time. And then he played the oboe in the orchestra that performed in the pump room in Bath. And in nine, in, he moved into 19 New King Street in Bath in the year that the street was built. Within a few years, he was director of public concerts at the Octagon uh, Chapel and conducted there the first performance in Bath of Messiah, as, uh, as you've seen in the handbill. Um, New King Street. For some time, here it is. It's, um, and you can see the uh, number 19. You can just about make out the blue block outside the front door of number 19, I hope. It's there on the left. Um, it's quite a narrow street, but it's very Georgian, a very Georgian street of houses, tall and narrow. And in fact, when you're in the, um, uh, the front drawing room um, on the upper floor, you can see uh, straight into the opposite windows. So, um, it, and uh, yes, and so there's uh, uh, a certain closeness to your neighbors. However, um, but for some time they lived at number seven. He and his brother Alexander, and later on their sister Caroline. And they still had to share the house with another family. And this was quite normal in those days. You rented properties, and so you could move very easily from place to place. And having your own house was uh, um, fairly exceptional. So sometime after they, they had lived in number seven, they moved into number 19, which is the one with the park. And this time they had the whole house to themselves. And this is the place which is open to the public and owned by the Herschel Trust. Um, and he developed an interest in astronomy. And Mike will now explain a little more about how he came to do that. One story I have heard is that Herschel came home from the pump room one evening after doing a performance and found a man out in the street with a telescope looking at something in the sky. I don't know what it was, possibly the moon. And he got very interested in this and said, I would like to study astronomy. He thought about it. Now, the man who he was speaking with, uh, 
uh, had a very fine small refracting telescope, uh, which was an acromat, which was the latest thing that had only been invented about 20 years earlier. Uh, but he decided he really wanted to know about astronomy and how to do it, what it was all about. So he got his hands on as many astronomy books as he could. He tried to assemble his own telescope and purchased optics. Uh, this turned out to be a little bit like what you might call a serial box telescope, not up to much. And so he decided that he could not afford to buy his own fine, small refracting telescope. And that was actually very good for the rest of us. Instead, he decided to make reflecting telescopes. I wonder if anybody here has ever made a telescope from scratch by polishing their own mirror up. No, these days you don't get very many people doing that. Back in what I was called the olden days when I was a boy, uh, uh, quite a few amateurs would still build their own telescopes, polish their own mirrors, and, and uh, work out exactly what to do from reference books. And uh, uh, Herschel decided to do this. And finally, in 1774, he made his first successful reflecting telescope. It was, this was a Newtonian design, uh, focal length of five and a half feet. And uh, a couple of years later, he actually built a 20 foot telescope of what's called the Herschelian type. So, one of the things he did was come up with a new idea for a way to look through a telescope. There were reasons why they did this. A Herschelian telescope, the front view type. Nowadays, if you had a really big reflector, you would use a prime focus. And uh, in, the, in the olden days, the astronomer would actually ride up in the uh, prime focus cave, take a lift all the way up to the top, climb down in, and on cold nights, you'd have to plug in a heat, a heat suit into a little socket. Um, those were the days. And uh, uh, and right up there, and heaven help you if you need to do a wee in the middle of your observing. Okay. But with Herschel's design, the only thing was that the telescope had to be large enough in diameter so that your head would not seriously interfere with the view of the light coming in. Uh, so the reason he did this not only was to save expense and effort, but also to reduce the number of reflections. And this is another telescope by Herschel. This one was found at Observatory House in Slough, which I'll come to much later. Uh, the Newtonian, and the reason for that is that it's too small to be a Herschelian. So we had a flat mirror to reflect the light to the side up at the top end of the telescope. And it was actually one of these seven foot telescopes that he used to discover Uranus, which I'll come to in a moment. So, in 1779, Herschel decided that just going out and taking pot shots at nice objects in the sky was all very well, but he wanted to do something a bit more scientific, a bit more systematic. And remember, he was an amateur astronomer, but a very gifted one. And so in 1779, he began a systematic survey of the sky and kept on working and working at that. He set the telescope up and used the rotation of the Earth to bring objects across the field of view. And, uh, and he did this from his back garden at 19 Kings, New King Street. They had a very nice clear view down to the south. The 13th of March, 1781, a strange object drifted across the field of view of his telescope. And he described it in his notes. And I should sure be very good at taking notes. At the bottom of that, you'll see it reads, he's got very good handwriting as well. And the quartile, I should use a German accent, but I won't. In the quartile, near Zeta Tauri, the lowest of two is a curious, either nebulous star or perhaps a comet. In fact, he thought it was a comet at first. It says a small star follows the comet at two thirds of the field's distance. 
but it needs a new diameter, I think. Um, you might notice if you look up at the top, you see some of his notes about the night before looking at uh, Mars. I think there was some frost or, or mist on Mars. And uh, 53, that's at 5.53 in the morning. I am uh, greatly sure there is a frost on Mars. And through a small telescope, uh, Uranus would look very much like the picture on the upper left, just a small dot, slightly larger than a star. How many of you have seen Uranus through a telescope? Fair number. It's not very hard to do. You'd have to find it. That's the main, main problem. But it's quite obvious. It's a fairly bright object. It's around six magnitude. Uh, on the right, a picture through a somewhat larger telescope and here you might be able to see some satellites, I'm not sure. If you had a really humongous telescope like the Keck giant telescope in Hawaii, you might find views somewhat like the ones on the bottom. Possibly not seeing the rings of red, but you can see the planet quite clearly. But not many of us get a chance to look through the eyepiece of a 150 inch much bigger telescope. Well, in 1782, after the discovery of the planet, uh, he published a catalog of the double stars that he had found. And he visited Maskelyne, Neville Maskelyne, the astronomer royal at Greenwich, uh, who invited him to come to get Greenwich to demonstrate his telescope. And it was very obvious that the optical quality of the telescope was. Um, was superior to anything they had down in Greenwich. So already they're going to be jealous. They'll want one. So immediately people started ordering Herschel telescopes. Uh, Herschel actually made quite a lucrative sideline out of making telescopes like the seven foot uh, for, uh, for sale to wealthy hunters, let's say. Life at 19 New King Street took on a new reality after the discovery of the planet. They became increasingly devoted to astronomy. They set up a workshop in the basement. Brother would make mechanical parts using a self made lathe. Sorry? That's one here. That's the one I believe that Alexander actually made himself. It's a very fine little piece of kit. And over here on the left, you see Herschel in a drawing, uh, presumably by imagination, busy polishing the mirror, and Caroline there uh, faithfully helping him by feeding him while he continues to polish, because you can't stop halfway through and take a break. Again, what if he needed to do? I don't know what, what she would do. Uh, but he would, he would carry on for several hours until finally he just had to drop from exhaustion, but he kept the job done. Uh, made, made quite a bit of uh, spare change out of uh, these uh, telescopes. Um, now, they were made of speculum metal. And I don't know if you've ever heard of speculum metal. You're more used to the idea that mirrors were made of glass and silver, or later on, made of glass and aluminum. And that's the sort of thing you would buy nowadays. It's a great advantage great advance in the later 19th century and early 20th century to have silvering. And when I was at Mount Wilson, they still had the tanks equipment that they used for silvering the mirror when it was first uh, put in the under each telescope. Uh, and, and the 60 inch also had something similar. Uh, and they only switched over to aluminizing in, I think, about the 1930s. It was a long story. What? You were not there in the 1930s. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did have to give that one a miss. Well, speculum is a mixture of uh, copper and tin, about a two to one mixture. And they usually had to add something to it, like uh, metals such as arsenic or antimony. Uh, 
And in most cases, it was arsenic, which you had to be careful with, as you might imagine. Speculum was very shiny and highly reflective, but it had one drawback in that it would tarnish very quickly. That was a disadvantage of silvering as well, but with silver, you can strip the coat and start over. With speculum, the only way you could uh, get the shine back is to repolish the mirror, which meant refiguring uh, the last stages. Um, their attempts at casting were done in the basement. There we are. This is part of the basement in the house. Uh, and there is a, that's not really the furnace they use. That's a, 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 using a plugged in light to make it look as if it's glowing. But um, if they would uh, make attempts at casting specular mirrors from molten metal in the basement, Caroline joined in. Cross it out where it says enthusiastically. <laughs> um, yes, I think because Caroline had arrived in Bath as a, a singer, um, she found herself keeping house for her two brothers. And uh, I think partly, I imagine, because uh, William, once he started his survey of the heavens, was up at night constantly. And she decided that. Um, Rather than than uh, put up with this, she might might as well join in, which she did. Um, she was uh, not she was more than just the person who made the coffee, although she did do that to keep him awake at night. Um, and she also kept detailed diaries, and it's from her diaries that we get quite a lot of the information about life at New King Street and in Bath, um, and uh, when they eventually moved to Slough. So she describes the attempt to make one of these um, mirrors, and it involved making a mold um, using horse dung, partly. Why is not technically um, very good um, thermal properties. Yeah, thermal properties, as you say. Um, and the mix of metals was altered. They tried a second time, and the result was disastrous. The metal, there was 538 pounds of this stuff, and they were melting it in the little scullery at the back of the house, which you can see here. And it began to leak through the bottom of the furnace into the fire and poured across the floor. And she wrote, both my brothers and the caster and his men were obliged to run out at opposite doors for the stone flooring, which ought to be taken up, flew about in all directions as high as the ceiling. So the flagstones you can see in that photograph are replacements, presumably, and um, they, they were nearly all killed from the sound of it. So um, that was the end of that particular experiment, to cast something quite so large. I will add that subsequent efforts were successful. And they didn't have that uh, kind of disaster again, but the one disaster really made an impression. Um, well, in the house, a uh, very comfortable house, it's very nicely um, appointed. This is the drawing room. Uh, you've got a, I think that's a celestial globe rather than a terrestrial globe. Uh, a portrait of Herschel above the fireplace. Uh, Big window to look out across the street into the house across the street uh, and see what they're up to. And uh, just a very comfortable room, and, and the family could relax there. No televisions, of course, not even radios. They can sing to each other uh, and, and also practice some music. Uh, and Herschel also would teach his pupils. He was quite involved in being a music tutor. He would teach his pupils in the music room, which was also upstairs. Out in the garden, not far from where this is, uh, Caroline and William, especially William, went out one night and, as you heard, discovered Uranus coming through his telescope field of view. Thought it was a comet, 
but it turned out that it was indeed a planet. Now, we saw his notebook, and uh, I always use that as an example to students of how to keep a good notebook, because uh, that A, proved what he saw, B, it described what he saw, and, and you can't dispute what he did see, the careful notes of times and what it looked like and so forth. There are other astronomers who did observe this planet even before Herschel. Uh, the best known of these are probably Pierre Le Monnier, who was a French astronomer at the uh, Observatory of Paris. And he, in fact, observed the planet about 12 times at least noted down its position, but his telescope was somewhat inferior. He didn't distinguish it from a star, and he never did repeat observations to check what he was seeing in the sky. He assumed anything point-like that he sees is a fixed star. But it was great that he did this because eventually astronomers were able to go back, use his data, and deduce the orbit of the planet very quickly and decide that it was indeed not a comet, but a planet. Comets move, as you know, in, in elliptical orbits and uh, planets in orbits that are also elliptical, much more nearly circular. And uh, they found this very quickly uh, in this case. So they knew right away it was a planet. I won't go into all of the questions of what are they going to call it. Eventually they did settle on Uranus there. Herschel is one name somebody suggested. No, thank you. It's a bit over the top. Uh, George's star was Herschel's idea. And uh, one reason for this, well, I'll come to that in a couple of moments. Uh, now, astronomers expressed a lot of skepticism about Herschel's claims of using. I did magnification 1,540 times, and I saw, you know, Martians running around or something on the surface. Uh, but in fact, Herschel really did make very small eyepieces. As you know, the smaller the eyepiece, the shorter the focal length, the higher the magnification. Herschel's most powerful eyepiece there was barely one inch in length, and I'm sure you would lose light if your eye was fully dark adapted looking through that thing, the, the ocular lens is very small. So you get very high magnifications, though I'm not sure exactly how useful those are. But skepticism was not warranted. He really did have these very high magnifications. Herschel was asked to demonstrate his telescope to King George III at Windsor. The king was very impressed and said, I'd like you to be my royal as my king's astronomer. And I'll set you up with a stipend of 200 pounds a year. Your duty is to move house to Datchet near Windsor and uh, be available whenever I wish to show royal parties and guests the wonders of the heavens. Uh, and so, indeed, that's exactly what happened. Herschel took up these royal duties, they moved to Datchet, and, uh, and uh, he continued to do his astronomy. Fortunately, the king was interested in astronomy, but not so interested that he's a pest. And as a result, Herschel was able to get on with his work quite well, and uh, on the occasion he would have visitors. And he was very, a very sort of easygoing fellow, and he was more than happy to have visitors come and uh, look through the telescope once in a while. This carried on throughout his entire working life. Um, Herschel uh, published a number of papers during this period of time, other than his famous, most famous paper, of course, is An Account of the Comet, exactly about the planet. One of his discoveries was to plot the motions of stars, their proper motions, uh, across the sky and see whether there is any systematic movement such that stars, uh, if the sun was moving through the field of stars in the galaxy, if we're moving towards 
towards the point in the sky, stars there would not move as much in proper motion. Uh, but the ones to the side, 90 degrees away, would be moving rapidly, uh, appear to be moving as, as the sun and solar system moved ahead. And uh, this is a little hard to see this diagram, but the idea is that if you had a nearby star uh, and the Earth and the sun rather moved from one place to another over the course of a couple of years, uh, the stars would move quite a bit across the sky, but distant stars would not move very much. I don't know if I can raise the point here. Here's the distant star, here's the distant star. They're not moving very much in the sky. The proper motions are small. But nearby stars would have much larger proper motions. That was the idea that he based his, his work on. He actually did a reasonably good job of this, despite sort of what we call picking and choosing his data. Um, but he came up with a result that was that showed that the sun and the solar system were moving roughly in the direction of, of the constellation Hercules, uh, or possibly Lyra in that part of the sky. And even today, uh, more refined proper motion studies show that he was never, he was not more than about 10 degrees out. And remember that proper motions were very, very primitive. Uh, measurements in those days. Um, he also used StarCap to try to establish the rough this shape of the local star system. Uh, and he found that in some directions towards the Milky Way, there were lots more stars in the field of view than there were if you look out 90 degrees away towards what we now call the galactic poles. Uh, and so he drew this diagram and this other paper uh, showing kind of in a schematic way. He didn't actually say that the system was a, a rectangular solid. This is just an illustration of, of the idea that it's flat and thin. Uh, he thought the system was bifurcated, that is, that it had a split in it, as you can see on the left hand side of that diagram. In fact, we know. That was caused by interstellar dust that he didn't know anything about. Uh, one of his great discoveries, in some ways more important than the planet, was the problem of double stars and parallax. And here she'll have an idea to use two stars that look very close together in the sky uh, and, um, and look for an annual shifting back and forth of one of them relative to the other, where the, the nearer one would move and the one behind would stay in, in place. The trouble is he didn't realize that most double stars in the sky, if they're close, they are physical pairs and not just line of sight coincidences. So his idea was to use uh, the double stars to look for a differential parallax of one star against another. Uh, that didn't work, but he did discover double stars. And towards the end of his life, he accepted that they were physical pairs. And he's a good statistician could have told him this 20 years earlier and saved him a lot of worry. But uh, he made many observations over the course of several years. And as a result of that, uh, he found orbits of the stars, and they were moving in orbit around one another, putting the universal in Newton's universal law of gravitation. Herschel's moved to Old Windsor, and uh, at this point, the King George III uh, was, uh, was very agreeable, and uh, he asked him to fund a 40-foot focal length telescope that would have a 48-inch diameter mirror. And he moved to South, a, a place that was later named Christen Observatory House. I don't think they built it. I think it was all in there. Just got a new name instead of a, a burning cottage or something. Uh, in 1788, Finally, cast a successful mirror, 48 inches in diameter for a 40 foot telescope. And it's a, a biggie.
So they moved to Slough. And uh, this is a contemporary illustration of the 40 foot telescope. Uh, coincidentally, it's also the subject of the first photographic plate taken by his son, John Herschel. And it also formed the basis of the um, badge of the Royal Astronomical Society. That's a different story. But here you see two gentlemen uh, at the base of the telescope in the garden. Of course, there was no dome, so you had to just protect it against the weather as well as you can. Um, you might want to say something about it. So this is a model of, um, of the of the forty foot telescope in the Star Museum, and it's operated by ropes and pulleys, and had speaking tubes, so that William could converse with Caroline. And I think you can see in the model there. There's uh, Herschel at the top, and uh, Caroline sits at the bottom. This is really the image that, that is used for the sculpture in the garden in, in Bath, because Caroline was up all night as well, um, taking notes. And uh, so although we assumed that it was actually William's handwriting in that um, notebook, uh, he may have written all this up afterwards, and it was Caroline who, who scribbled down what she could in the dark. Um, and uh, she brought the coffee and uh, it was generally essential. They hired local men to do the heavy work of, um, of, of hauling the, uh, the, the, the machinery around. This was so that William's dark vision wouldn't be ruined and uh, he would shout down instructions to the men as well operating the telescope. And it was this telescope which was visible from coaches traveling on the Bath Road from London to Bath as they went through Slough. And it was uh, pointed out by travellers. There's the, uh, there's, the, there's in fact the, the first edition of the, um, I think what must be the local six inch map of Slough, because in fact the, it shows the railway line which opened in 1838. And uh, if you look a little closer, you can see there's Herschel's telescope in big letters. The observatory house was just in Windsor Road, just um, south of the crossroads in the middle of Slough. Um, it was demolished eventually in, I think, the 1960s for road widening. But it, it's the the, um, the the topography is otherwise very similar. And there's the station to the north. And also on the map, if you look at the bottom right hand corner, you can see Upton. And this is Upton Church that's um, uh, situated just down there as well. And the road leading uh, from Upton towards Central um, Slough and Windsor Road is Upton Road. And there was an account, um, this is Caroline's account, I imagine, um, of the construction of the 40 foot. Large numbers of locals were employed in building the telescope, with timber scaffolding nearly 50 feet high and a fully movable circular foundation with speaking tubes. The gigantic sheet iron tube was assembled in a barn at Upton and carried by 24 men along Albert Street. That's the road along it, and up Windsor Road to the house. And you, if, if, if I drive back from um, uh, further south through Windsor and Slough to get to, um, uh, to Harrow, where we live now, um, I have to sit at the traffic lights just there at the corner of Albert Street and look up the hill to just where the observatory house used to be, and then uh, drive along Albert Street and, and uh, get the, the, the road that uh, uh, leads northeast. So they assembled in the, in the barn at Upton, carried by 24 men along Albert Street to the house. The king, of course, came to view the stars along with many others. And uh, I, so in fact, this is not Caroline's words because um, this is where it says that Herschel was renowned for his good nature and patience, as well as his astronomy, and put up with all the visitors who came to, to um, see the giant telescope. That sounds familiar. Uh, 
Although I just I just have to add that in fact it was demolished in the 1820s. And uh, what 19? No, late, later on. Which? Well, the, no, no, not the house. The house, the, the telescope itself. Um, and it must have been later than the 1820s because John Herschel and all the family um, stood around it and, and had a requiem for the, the, the because it was uh, had long since um, uh, fallen out of use. And this was after Herschel's death, which was 1822. Uh, where am I? <laughs> uh, Herschel was a very skilled draftsman, a very skilled drawer of, of uh, the um, planets that he saw and other objects. One of the things that he drew, this is before Uranus was discovered. This is, the dates on these, I think, you may not be able to see it, but March and April of 1774 on the left. The rings at John. But on April 3rd, 1774, the rings disappeared. You could see the shadow, but you could not see the rings themselves. So Herschel was able to deduce, as his Congress had been for some time, that the rings must be very, very thin compared to their extent. A few years later, um, Years later, uh, he, years later, he drew Saturn with the rings open. And uh, uh, he also saw a large white spot on part of Saturn. Uh, I don't know if this is a temporary or permanent feature. I think that something that comes and goes on Saturn. Uh, but uh, you see that it's kind of an indentation in the main equatorial band. And that's another picture of Saturn that he drew. And here you see three bands on Saturn. Next to it is, uh, well, it's, you can't really reproduce photographs that well in, in printed material back in the uh, 15th century. That's his picture of the ring nebula in Lyra. Uh, the hint there is at the bottom of the picture where it's a, the 57th, and you know that's N57, the ring nebula. Uh, and that's what it looked like and, and didn't actually have speckles in it. That's how you can draw it and get it printed. One of the great things that Herschel did was conduct a very serious scientific investigation. This is more than just looking at something. This is thinking about solar radiation and what it consists of. And in those days, they didn't really know much about light. Physics was not very far ahead. Uh, uh, they knew about diffraction, so they knew about the wave nature of light to some extent. But um, Herschel put the light of the sun through a prism into a darkened room uh, where the light of different colors could fall on a set of thermometers. And uh, the basic idea illustrated in the diagram, uh, if you put a band of light from the sun onto the thermometer, you can watch how much it rises in temperature and use that as a measurement of the amount of heat you get. And so on the left here, you see it is actual experimental setup, which involves a number of different thermometers and a prism to refract the light of the sun, different colors. And on the right, you see what he found was actually so astounding to him that he, he actually wrote it up. And some of the things, that, some of the words he uses actually are remarkably prescient. Uh, the uh, thin dotted line there, uh, with the colors written underneath, are visible light. And that is a measure of how much the thermometers went up essentially as each of these bands of light um, came through the prism onto the table. So on the right-hand side, the thin line is 
the apparent light, which is measured, but the solid black area is a plot of the amount that the thermometers went up. So light intensity is a thin line, but the amount of heat measured by the thermometers is the dark area. And what you can see is that the peak of the energy received from the sun was way beyond or just at the edge of the red spectrum. And that this continued on a considerable distance uh, further into the infrared, below the red or beyond the red. And so he, uh, he believed from this that heat rays and light rays were probably the same thing, but the heat rays were invisible to the eye. Okay, so this is, uh, now I've just repeated part of what we already saw, but Herschel carried on and carried on. In 1803, he was, he was about 65 then. He decided being a bachelor wasn't really uh, what he wanted to be. He married a wealthy widow, as don't we all try to, uh, if we're men, uh, like, uh, what's his name, Beckham? Yeah. Uh, and he went married a wealthy widow named Mary Pitt. They had one son named John, who's later a very famous astronomer in his own right. I'll say something a little bit about it uh, later. In 1816, Herschel was, uh, was, uh, oh, hang on, now. Herschel was knighted and elected the first president of the New Astronomical Society uh, of London, later the Royal Astronomical Society. Now, John continued his father's work by taking a telescope, one of the telescopes, I think it was the 20th telescope, to Cape Town in South Africa and uh, observing the southern sky so as to complete the work begun by his father, which is only in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and, uh, and he succeeded in doing this and extended the catalogs of nebulae, double stars, and whatnot. Uh, considerably, and he also extensively studied the amazing and bizarre behavior of the star that we call Eta Carina. Anybody heard of Eta Carina? Yeah, Eta Carina, that for a while, was one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's now believed to be some sort of strange, sort of slow supernova or something. Something's going on there. It's a very, very active object, much, much fainter now. But it got up to, I think, first magnitude briefly in the 1830s. John observed it uh, along with this other, other astronomers who were at the Cape, Her Majesty's astronomers, had the Royal Observatory at the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, so they moved to Cape Town. He completed his father's survey. And uh, one remarkable fact about his time there, it's not William, but John, was that. Uh, he and his wife, Mary, at one point had dinner with two persons who were visiting from a Royal Navy survey ship. The name of the ship was HMS Beagle, and the people were the captain, uh, Robert Fitzroy, and his science, what we might call his science officer, a certain Mr. Charles Darwin. Now there would have been a dinner to me, fly on the wall. <laughs> Um, curiously, very little is said in the diaries of either party about the event, although Mary, I think, was the one who actually recorded that they met Mr. Darwin uh, uh, when the ship was in town. Uh, I'm not sure that Darwin's diary actually mentions it, although I may be only seeing the abridged version. Uh, it, was, it, it was the Boys of the Beagle was published as a book and uh, uh, and it was a very, best, very big bestseller in its day. Anyway, um, William Herschel 
died in September 1822 at Observatory House in Sal. He was buried at the nearby parish church at Upton. And about, about roughly about the year 2000, we don't know the exact date, he was um, a glass, a stained glass window was uh, placed in the church to commemorate, well, actually to commemorate the solar system. But seeing as how their most famous guest person, body, the most, most famous person in the churchyard was William Herschel. Um, they came up with a design that honored both the planets and Herschel for his discoveries. So here at the top, you see Uranus, see several, several other planets. At the bottom, you see um, the image of, well, possibly William, maybe somebody else looking down the port of the telescope to uh, and studying objects in the night sky. So he's, a, he's a, although one of Great Britain's greatest scientists of the day, he's not buried in Westminster Abbey, but they do have a plaque on the floor dedicated to William Herschel. 1738, 1822, Celorum Perupit Claustra, which translates as he broke through the barriers of the heavens. And uh, we'll have the final word, of course. So when he was 76 in 1813, Herschel had met a Scottish poet called Thomas Campbell, they met in Brighton. And Campbell later recalled that speaking of himself, he said with a modest of manner, which quite overcame me, Modest. modesty of manner, which quite overcame me, when taken with the greatness of the assertion, I have looked further into space than ever human being did before me. I have observed stars of which the light, it can be proved, must take Two million years to reach the Earth. Right. Okay, and that and the end, yeah. Now of course that's not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning. Um, just one last question before I turn it over to questions from the audience. If Herschel said he could prove that the light must take two million years to reach Earth, actually we know that probably wasn't strictly correct. He was off by a factor of 10 or so. But how did he make that deduction? It's a question for the students exercise book. Uh, maybe people want to, want to discuss that a little bit. Um, Herschel was truly a great character a man of, of great personal integrity and virtue. And uh, uh, we don't see many people like him anymore these days. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening to us. We'll be happy to take questions. You may have noticed it says alibi sepultus, which doesn't mean he did it, but he's got an alibi. <laughs> uh, it means he was interred elsewhere. There's a question on Zoom. Yes, please. Um, so uh, on Zoom, the question is, when William was conducting his sky survey, how did he record his results? In a notebook. I mean, I mean he, was, he, he was writing down everything that he saw. I think Caroline was there taking notes. So we're not sure whether that was his handwriting or not, but in that on that page I showed, I think it was his handwriting. But to a large extent, uh, she would probably take notes for him again because of the problem of dark adaptation. Yeah. If you have to turn on or light a candle or something every time you want to, uh, uh, or use a lantern every time you want to make a note, you're not going to have very good dark vision. I imagine but, that that, yeah. that she took down rapid notes and he wrote them up the next day. That's very possible. That's why it looks like it is William's 
handwriting right. But well, would they have noted the position of each object that they were looking at? They would note the time already. of observation very precisely. And from that, they could, Caroline had to do a lot of calculating. Because she, she would calculate yeah. from the exact time that it, something went across the transit. Of the transit right. Of and the they telescope. knew which direction the telescope was pointing. Yes. And that gave them the position in the sky. That's right. Well, they mostly used it as a meridian transit. Yes. Yeah. That's how they would get right ascensions and yeah. See any anyone in the room then? We have a, another Zoom comment. Yes, okay. So um, Jeff Bryant says, can somebody at the university please thank the present uh, presenters for one of the most interesting and informative presentations on the topic of the history of astronomy I have ever heard. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. And I guess that means you're going to have to put it on YouTube now. <laughs> oh, yes. We, uh, we had a little email exchange. He said, would you be willing to put it on YouTube? And I said, yes, if it's good. No, <laughs> it's not terrible. Now, in fact, I, I, I would say that, uh, I mean, this, well, frankly, we do not do academic lectures here. But this has been a presentation that, uh, that, that the style of it has been such that we can all not only follow it, but enjoy it. Uh, we've learned a lot about it, um, uh, about uh, William Herschel and his work. And uh, I'd like to thank you both again very, very much. Thank you for inviting us.